Hello, hello, everyone. So I always start my webinar the same. I really gotta switch it up for you guys. But uh, welcome to our next part of our webinar series this month. So this month is all about mental health. And one of the specific topics that we are covering today is more so in relation to emotional adversities that we go through. Uh, if you saw Poppy, he's here to join us too. So today my goal is to really help you guys understand how different things that we've gone through emotionally can actually play a role physically and physiologically in our bodies. I know that a lot of us have gone through stress and you know we say that every time I'm stressed, I get a knot in my stomach. Every time I'm stressed, you know, I don't want to eat. Every time I'm stressed, I want to eat everything. Or when I get stressed, you know, I get headaches. And we always know that stress affects us in a negative way and can also create physical symptoms, but we don't always necessarily understand how that can actually manifest later down the line. And we don't always understand how that can actually play a role in our health and even the onset of a diagnosis or the onset of symptoms. So tonight, I'm going to be having you understand more about how this emotional piece of the puzzle can actually affect us in a negative way and can affect us in a way that you are completely unaware. Because I know in my own personal experience, you know, I know that I went through certain things when I was young and, you know, there were times in my life that I felt a lot of anger, a lot of resentment and a variety of other emotions. But as time passes, you assume that you have healed from those specific scenarios or that because it's not in your conscious mind that you're not being affected by those previous situations or those previous emotions. And I realized that one of the biggest obstacles for my personal healing journey actually had a lot to do with the fact that I had a lot of unresolved emotional components that I didn't even realize could actually play a role in my physical health. And it was a huge, huge aha moment for me as a practitioner, because it wasn't even just about my own healing journey. It was about, oh my gosh, how many of my patients are dealing with this as an I'm really excited about bringing this information to you. And I also will have Dr. Nick be uh, joining us shortly. He's just finishing up with some of his patients because Dr. Nick is really the one who actually heads uh, an amazing uh, method in our practice that helps people to work through these emotional layers that are contributing to them not feeling emotionally well, but also that could be contributing to their physical health declining. So uh, so get ready because it's going to be some really awesome information that you guys have never heard before. And I'm actually going to give you specifics on how specific diagnoses and pathologies are actually linked to very specific types of emotions. So you guys are going to literally have your mind blown tonight. But I know that every time we do these webinars, there are a bunch of you that are my regulars that are here with me. And then there are a lot of you that are brand new. And there's a lot of you that are new that are just tuning in because you're interested in this subject. So just to kind of have a little bit of a background on ourselves um, and also our practice is um, I work here with Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick is actually my husband. We opened this practice uh, about eight years ago. And one of our biggest obstacles was actually figuring out how we were going to support people from a mental health and emotional standpoint. And the reason I say this is because we could have easily just brought in conventional therapy, but we didn't necessarily feel that that was the best fit. And the only reason I say that is because of our deep understanding of functional neurology. So I'm not sitting here saying that therapy is a bad thing, uh, definitely not uh, my intention, but when it comes to neurology and when you have a pattern or you have a story, you can create very, very strong neurological pathways from the experience, but then reliving that experience through talking about it constantly. 
So we knew that we wanted to provide something different than just your conventional talk therapy, something that was truly able to take neurology into consideration and break the neuroplasticity, break those patterns, and really be able to reverse engineer how we think about our emotional you know, adversities or the different things that we have been through. Uh, Pure Life, I will definitely make sure to add you to the list. Um, just by the way, for those of you that are listening, I know some of you are on Instagram and some of you are here on the webinar. If for any reason you have to cut out soon, that's okay. You can get the replay. If you are on the Instagram, you will have to direct message me your email in order to get the replay. Um, but anybody who's on the actual webinar, you will get a replay to either watch later or to share with others. So, uh, so we got you covered on all of that. Um, so again, we really wanted to be able to figure out how we can best help people. And we wanted to make sure that we were providing something that was going to really help people resolve the things they've been through and walk away feeling free of their shame or abandonment or their grief or anger or rage. And we literally learned so many methods. It was everything from EMDR to talk therapy to different types of energetic work to uh, tapping techniques, literally, you name it, we, we have learned it. And Dr. Nick started really taking the aspects of all of these different types of therapies and started to really hone in on what was going to be the most effective for people. And one of our mentors that's been one of our mentors for a very long time is Dr. Demartini. So one of the things I will be telling you guys about tonight is the Demartini method and how we actually integrate that in our practice as being one of the most effective methods to help us dissolve emotional traumas, resentments, judgments that we are still dealing with. And guys, like for those of you that are here, just don't feel ashamed of your emotional stuff. We all have stuff. Anybody who says that they're emotionally sound is lying to you. And it's okay that we've all gone through things. It's okay that we have judgments sometimes. It's okay that we feel a certain way and that we sometimes get reactive. But tonight, I'm gonna to help you guys understand why. Why do you get triggered? Why do you have these emotional resentments? Like, why do you have judgments against like certain people or certain ways people act? It's gonna help you feel clarity, but also help you feel more free of these things. And obviously help you to understand how this is actually playing a role in your body and in your health. So obviously for us, like our practice, you know, you guys that have been listening to us for a while, we do a lot of things here. And we do a lot of things because each and every single one of you are different. And also when it comes to this emotional side of things is that not everyone comes into our practice and automatically needs an emotional therapy. There he is. Uh, some people need to actually balance out their body before they are even ready to work on that. Because if your neurotransmitters are completely bottomed out and you have no serotonin, you have no feel-good hormones, and your body isn't in a chronic stress state, like you're in this fight or flight overdrive, it's gonna be really hard for you to work through the method. So we really try to take into consideration, like do we need to do some foundational work before you actually start to uncover those emotional layers and work through them. And then we have pet therapy, by the way. Oh yes, and, the best, and then best this is this is Pappy. He is here to uh, to join all of you and provide as much therapy as possible. Um, so overall for the both of us, I, I think that we both have different stories. I know you guys have heard my story a million times of why we do what we do. I wanna actually let Nick share because he is the one who is really heading this type of work in our practice. And you know his reasons for being so passionate about helping people work through their emotional stuff is, is really part of his own journey. So I'll let you tell him a little bit more about like why you are interested in this work in the first place. So if I can get Pappy to relax a little bit. <laughs> I got into the mental emotional aspect um, 
honestly, when I was a really, really young age, uh, first and foremost, I realized just um, to be great at, uh, great, a great athlete, um, I really had to not just own the physical side, but I had to also own the, the mental strength as well. Um, it's like, you know, when it's fourth and goal and the ball's going to you, you got to have that mental strength that's like, yeah, I'm, I'm the perfect one that's designed to take on this pressure and to come through with it. So all of that initially started, <laughs> you're killing me, Pappy, uh, as, as a young kid being an athlete. And then I love you too. <laughs> going through, going through that, um, my mom actually had stage one breast cancer um, when I was also very young, and I was at a point where I didn't really understand it. I just knew we we're a medical <laughs> model. Uh, she went through, uh, and she had radiation. She had chemotherapy. She had a mastectomy. I remember her just like constantly throwing up, losing her hair. Just like I'm like, this is not what health and wellness is. Um, and it led an everlasting mark uh, emotionally uh, on me. And throughout my journey, kind of fast forward, it wasn't until I got into college playing college football, I got my sixth concussion. And with that, pretty much everything was a big reset. Uh, I had to stop playing football. My whole identity was wrapped up as an athlete. So I didn't know who I was. Um, I had a lot of post-concussion syndrome issues from that. Um, at the time, people didn't even know what post-concussion syndrome was, um, so nobody knew how to, A, diagnose me correctly and also help me with my symptoms, but my symptoms had light sensitivity, I had a lot of gastrointestinal issues, um, I had this low-level anger that would literally come around all the time, and fortunately or unfortunately, um, nobody could help me. Uh, I went to therapists, they said it was all in my head, that I had to get a different hobby because I was an athlete and I just had to find a different sport. I tried that, I did uh, triathlons for nine years, um, was crazy competitive with that, but I still, that didn't help um, my, a lot of the symptoms that were happening. And from that, I realized uh, for me, my neurological system came down and what came up were all my other issues that I wasn't having symptoms earlier, uh, but soon as I had the chance, uh, then it arose. So my stomach issues that weren't really a problem became a problem. My emotional issues that I hadn't dealt with from, a, figuring out who I was as a person, what was most important to me, uh, but also things of dealing with um, my parents um, having health issues. So my mom had stage one cancer that eventually turned into stage four cancer. My dad had multiple sclerosis. Like my, my granddad had was a farmer and ended up dying of four different types of cancers. So it was a lot of frustration and anger um, coming around that perception. Uh, that really led me into realizing that in order to heal, I had to look at every single system, uh, not only individually, but also how each system worked together. Um, understanding now, probably what I love focusing on the most are both neurological as well as um, the mental, emotional uh, areas of the life. But understanding that our biochemistry as well as our energetic, uh, all it affects all the different systems. But for me, I had to really go through and help pretty much, quote unquote, not heal, but bring into balance my my emotional discrepancies that were polarized. Um, and actually in order to allow my brain chemistry and neurology to help even out so I could work on those exercises um, and heal. And I was there for the whole journey, guys. Mm -hmm. So talk about support. <laughs> she might have gave me more challenge than anything, but, you know, <laughs> it was support in her mind. <laughs> yeah, it is always interesting how they say opposites attract and then, you know, you're, you're opposites, but you're there to balance each other. And uh, we couldn't actually have been more opposite, but, um, but it actually ended up really creating a lot of growth on either side. So, so when you're having those judgments against your, your spouse for challenging you, you know, it's actually a really beneficial thing uh, that we really you know, once we put our guards down, I think we actually really helped each other a lot. So, you know, as we get into this conversation, I think that one of the big things that's a really huge disclaimer to make is that, you know, and I say this in all of my webinars, it's it's not your fault that you feel a certain way or you haven't been, been able to work through, you know, your grief or you haven't been able to work through your anxieties or you haven't been able to work through, you know, feeling ashamed or, or your abandonment. You know, there's a lot of different things that show up in our lives and we really, we don't always understand why they present themselves. And 
you know, in reality, when we look at medicine and we look at psychology and psychiatry, it's so easy nowadays to just, you know, provide some type of palliative fix, which is a medication. And, you know, I always ask the question of, you know, what would the world be if there was no medication? You know, if we really had to dig deeper and we had to figure out a way to cope and medications obviously serve their purpose in extreme states. But if we really had to to deal with the situation, um, I think that, you know, it would be different because it's so easy nowadays to stay in the bad relationship or stay at the job that we hate because we could just take the medication and really just buffer the symptoms. And, you know, if we had to had to feel the feelings, we might actually take action on those things and and seek out a different path. But obviously, there's other situations that are more difficult when we deal with, you know, childhood emotional traumas and abuse and things like that. And it's really being able to know that there are methods out there that can help to work through these types of things. So some of the, the foundational things that we really look at in this practice is that obviously we want to really understand is the emotional side a part of the health puzzle? But also too, is when you are working with a psychologist or a psychiatrist and you're dealing with some type of depression or anxiety or some other type of mental health issue, then a lot of times they're not necessarily asking you more questions about your physical health. And they're not necessarily looking at, you know, do you have an underlying gastrointestinal issue? But when you look at basic physiology, 95% of your serotonin, which is your feel good hormone, is actually made in your gut. So we have this healthcare system that is based on the segregation of our systems and we're completely ignoring basic physiology. And we really need to understand that the body is an integration of systems. And sometimes the depression or the anxiety is being caused by that chemical deficiency, but sometimes that chemical deficiency is actually a result of the emotional adversities that we've gone through. <laughs> Nick now has to compete with how much I talk. <laughs> it's not a competition. I just sit here and be quiet. <laughs> so as we start to get into this topic and talking more about it, I think that, you know, some of the things that you guys are going to take away tonight is that trauma can actually manifest in physical tissue. And a lot of this foundation comes from Chinese medicine, which we're going to talk more about. But I think that one of the most fascinating things that um, we have really started to understand and ask better questions in our consultations is how not only do specific emotions manifest in specific tissues, but also the left and the right side of the body actually have different um, manifestations when it comes to female versus male. And I'm going to make more sense of that in, in a minute. So we had a specific patient who came in to, she saw me specifically. And when we were doing her testing, she just had some really interesting things coming up. Um, she said that she was dealing with a lot of depression and anxiety. She didn't necessarily talk more about it. She's just like, I've been dealing with this for a really long time, but that's not really why I'm here. I'm here because I'm having a lot of um, gastrointestinal pain and I'm also having a lot of pain on my right side. My right shoulder is really hurting. Um, I'm having chest pain and then I'm also having like pain in my ribs. So like anatomically I start thinking, okay, does she have something going on in her liver? Does she have something going on in her lung, etc.? So we did a bunch of lab testing and it actually turned out that she was having a really significant issue with her right lung. She was actually um, coming up with emphysema. Emphysema, just so you understand, is like a, ri a rigidity in the um, the tissue. Like the tissue is not expanding. There's loss of elasticity. In addition, she was also coming up with very elevated liver enzymes, which was the culprit for her gastrointestinal problems. It was also the culprit for some of that right-sided rib cage pain. Um, and this was not due to a virus. This was all uh, non-viral hepatitis. Hepatitis just means um, inflammation in the hepatocytes, which is the liver uh, cells. 
So as I'm like uncovering these different things going on, she really didn't have infections. Like she didn't really have toxins. So I started to ask better questions and I said, you know, just so you know, the liver is associated with um, anger, resentment, uh, and even rage. I was like, the lung on the other hand is associated with grief and the right side of the body is associated with a male figure. So by any chance, do you feel like you have any anger or resentment or even um, have like feel like you have loss in relation to a male figure? And she breaks down in tears and she says, I'm divorcing my husband because he's been cheating on me. And I was like, oh, so anger, resentment towards him for her, the betrayal and then grief of the loss of this person who hasn't been lost because he died, but losing him now as a partner in life. And it was just so fascinating because this is a person who has physical manifestations, like physical problems in her tissue, but it was all tied. And all of the onset of her symptoms, by the way, were when she found out that her husband was cheating. And it was completely tied to these emotional components. And I know that you've seen a variety of different like things like this happen. Mm -hmm. So it's really just when you ask better questions because most of the time you're not, no doctor, you're not going in with a lung issue or a liver issue and they're asking you these questions. But we do because we know that anything can cause anything. It's not going to be just black and white, like, oh, you have a virus, let's call it a day. These are the people that go in, they're like, I feel like crap and your blood work looks good and you get told you're depressed. So it's really a matter of understanding the, the bigger picture here. So, um, so I'm going to let Nick talk about this too, but I think one of the biggest myths is that time heals all. I know that that's uh, such a term that is said is that like time will heal anything. But what I know in my own experience is that just because time has passed does not mean that you have resolved the, the person that you had an emotional charge towards or you have let go of a situation, you have let go of a judgment or a trauma. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize because we'll say, you know, we see some of these things coming up in your testing. You know, do you feel and they're like, well, I felt like that a long time ago, but I don't even think about that now. Like that can't be possible. That's affecting me now. But when you when you ask like, oh, yeah, I all the time, like literally, I just like wanted nothing to do with them. And I still don't talk to them. But that was so long ago. And I don't care about that anymore. And people don't realize that just because time has passed, and it's not in your conscious mind, it still is negatively impacting your body. How deep can I go? Oh, gosh, here we go. Go go for it, Carruthers. <laughs> so I'll try to get too crazy deep. Um, but really, it's like when you look at time heals all, uh, it's straight 100% myth because all trauma, everything, uh, it's foundationally just energy and all energy runs through cycles. Uh, so I always get feedback of, you know, you look at the stock market, it's a cycle. You look at the housing industry, it's a cycle. You look at the weather patterns, it cycles through the different seasons. Um, the same thing happens through anything that's actually unbalanced energy. Uh, so it's like when you look at our emotions, really fundamentally, our emotions are just energy. So the easiest way I always say is to look at it like a magnet. So all magnets have a north and south polarity, just like the earth. The earth has a north pole and has a south pole. So emotions, understanding that anything created has to have energy and actually has to be balanced. Uh, it's our really our awareness um, and how we perceive things that tends to be imbalanced. Uh, so we see, quote unquote, too much of the positive, the benefits, or too much of the negative polarity, the drawbacks. And what really needs to occur to actually bring that into harmony is that we have to see both sides equally. So time heals all is really kind of a false uh, perception because anything that we actually don't bring into that harmony, that actual balance, uh, is going to cycle back into our life into the same or a different form to really give us an opportunity to learn uh, from the situation. So it's really not until we take the time uh, to go deep within ourselves um, bring the aspects that we either judge or don't quote unquote love ourselves uh, into that balance 
that then we can break the cycle and move on with our life. And this is a big foundation of the Demartini method, which we're going to talk about. But, you know, one of the other things that I mentioned earlier is that emotions cannot affect physical tissue. So the fascinating thing is that we have really separated out Eastern and Western medicine. And when we're talking about, you know, the foundation of Chinese medicine, this is something that's been around for thousands of years. And we really ignore it in, uh, you know, in this day and age, especially in the U.S., And really, when you get back to the foundation of understanding some of the principles of of Chinese medicine, there is so much relevance that is still affecting all of us in this day and age. We have just completely transformed everything to be so focused on medication, surgery, medication, surgery, when really at the end of the day, we have to start acknowledging these other layers because we all have stuff and we all have been through things and we are not necessarily being told that these things can play a role in our physical health. So uh, my personal uh, weak organ was my liver and liver is associated with resentment, rage and anger. We have lungs, which are associated with grief and loss. Kidneys are associated with fear and lack of life force. So this is kind of interesting because this is in relation to almost like not not knowing your purpose and not being able to kind of feel like you know what your goals in life are. And you can expand more upon that as well. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Chinese medicine, your kidney is really one of your most important organ systems because it is your life force. It's it's you being connected with the earth and with yourself and everything else. And preserving is, your blood, which, which you is, can't live yeah, without blood. It's <laughs> one of the most important filters in the body. Um, but it's like when you look at even the meridians of the body, your first uh, kidney meridian is on the bottom of your foot. Uh, so it's like walking barefoot is so important for grounding uh, because it's giving you the life force up to help your kidneys really be able to resonate with that Schumann resonance, that 78.3 hertz. Nobody um, knows what nobody that knows is, what brothers. That is. Somebody knows what that is. Um, <laughs> this is our dinner table conversations, right. by the way. <laughs> so really when you're looking at kidneys, and especially when the, the biggest thing uh, that challenges or stresses the kidneys out, Uh, on that emotional level is fear. Uh, The cool thing about fear is that very rarely, unfortunately, are we present uh, throughout the day. Um, Science has shown that we're only present about five to 10% of the day. So it's not that we use 10% of our brain, we use 100% of our brain, we're only conscious and present 10% of the day. So when we're not present, it's our subconsciousness uh, that's really running through and taking over. So it's really the quality of those programs running our subconsciousness that's really creating your reality because we're not making the decisions over 90 percent of the time to serve ourselves so when you're looking at the kidney the biggest thing that affects it is fear the interesting thing about fear is we really only fear (laughs) two things um the dinner conversations yes i love this the (laughs) come come join come eat (laughs) the only two things that we fear in life uh which is great because anytime that you challenge yourself and you catch yourself experiencing fear, ask yourself this question. First, be like, this is interesting, uh, because that takes you out of the limbic system and puts you into the prefrontal cortex where you can actually make a decision and you're not firing up your limbic system being judgmental. Which is your emotional center. Which is your emotional center. The second part is, all right, I can only fear one of two things. I fear a gain or a loss. So when you look at the animalistic nature, the animalistic mind, we're always trying to avoid pain and then go through, I'm looking at the best dinner conversation, <laughs> right, and then chasing pleasure. So we want to avoid pain, gain pleasure. So when it comes to fear, it's like we're fear of losing our pleasure or we're fear of gaining pain. Once yeah. you can really narrow that down, like, all right, which one of these am I fearing? Then we can actually create some better quality questions to answer why am I fearing this? You know, why am I fearing this game of pain or why am I fearing the loss of this pleasure? Because that's the attachments externally that we're really voiding within ourselves. And then we can ask the questions and really bring into balance the shit within ourselves uh, into harmony. Yeah, I think it's just like such a 
fascinating thing because that's really just the foundation of so much of our program is that everything is supposed to be good and nothing is supposed to be bad. It's like a, a world with only peace and no war. And we've been programmed to think that that's what we're all striving towards is that everything is going to be good and nothing should be bad. And this is what cr constantly creates this level of disappointment and it creates this massive imbalance and we're seeking out something that is so unbelievably not realistic and and then we're we're going after positive affirmations like how many for those of you into this world like how many of you have read write down positive affirmations and write them on your mirror and think positive and think positive positive thinking and it's like it literally can make you schizophrenic like i'm not even exaggerating our mentor dr d martini who created the foundation of the method Dr. Nick does in our practice, he literally said that he did positive thinking for how long? Was it a year or two years? It was two years, yeah. And he literally journaled it. And as he journaled it, he was moving into like a state of psychosis because was he was, depressive. yeah, he yeah. was so imbalanced. And it was just so fascinating hearing this because we are creating this unrealistic expectation that everything is always going to be good and nothing is going to be bad. So but it's like, we also, I mean, for the longest time that was me. It's like, I wanted to search for peace, but then it's like, when I started just increasing my awareness, I saw that there's not peace inside of us. It's like, we have an immune system that's attacking things. And mm -hmm. if we didn't have that attack, we would sometimes wouldn't survive. And mm -hmm. then it's like, I've unfortunately broken a lot of bones because I'm a boy and I do stupid things. Uh, but with that, it's like learning how bones actually rebuild. There's breakdown and there's build up. You can't yeah. have actually the growth without a destruction at the same time. It's just, it's, it's always in balance yep. without a doubt. So, you know, with this list, I know that you guys can't really see this. I'm going to actually flip the camera so you can. Ooh, what did I do? Uh, so these are just some really interesting things that uh, really manifest in the tissues. But I would say that some of the most common things that we see within our practice is we definitely see a lot of respiratory issues that are in relation to um, people that are just holding on to massive amounts of grief. We also see a lot of people that are dealing with the inability to digest um, due to pancreatic stress and pancreatic stress has so much to do with self identity. So many people just like don't even know who they are. They don't know, like they don't feel like they're living their purpose. They don't necessarily feel, ah! this is what's happening. This is what happens when you do things on an unstable surface. <laughs> Um, so these are people that are not necessarily in their lives. Um, and I would say another big one too is the large intestine and the large intestine has a lot to do with rejection and being defensive, but also too, is like when you're having specific symptoms, like, uh, specifically you're having constipation. A lot of that is like, what are you not willing to eliminate out of your life? Um, or if you're having chronic diarrhea, is like, what are you trying to eliminate out of your life at a rapid rate? So there's so many interesting, like, metaphysical um, manifestations of these different emotions and how they show up in our physical body. Would you say there's any specific ones that you see a lot? Well, I'd say it's cool. Like, I mean... When you look at Chinese principles and having different things, um, if you want to go back to that last one, um, when emotions get held into the tissues, the tissues are your subconsciousness. So it's like when all information first comes into the mind, it comes in through that limbic system uh, for us to be able to judge something. And when we can see it as whole, uh, balanced both on the positive negative polarity, equal amount of benefits and drawbacks, um, that's actually love, uh, seeing something completely true for just what it is. Uh, when we see for something as love for what it is, we actually transcend that into our imminent mind, uh, which is known as our super consciousness. The opposite side of that is when information comes in uh, through our limbic system and we judge it for either more good than bad, more positive than negatives, more benefits than drawbacks. Uh, that's split. So that information actually goes down to our subconscious mind, our animalistic nature, um, which that is a pol polarization change. And then it gets held into the subconsciousness, which is our body. Um, so that's like 
people always talk about a body, mind, and soul. So it's really your soul governs your mind and your mind dictates your body. So it's depending on how the mind actually rules and views thing, uh, that's going to dictate the expression of your body. Your body is going to there create your reality. Your reality is going to come back and give you either positive or negative feedback mechanism of symptoms, what we call pain and things that we either really, really like or really, really don't like, uh, which is really just us being able to see if something serves our value system or not. We're getting there. Don't I, jump. I, don't but, jump. But all of that is really going to get <laughs> held into our tissues. Done. I knew he was going to do this. <laughs> so, um, I want to I want to actually come back to this one because I know that you guys on Instagram can't see this, but there is a really fascinating book here that uh, was Hi Victoria uh, <laughs> was written by Louise Hay, um, which we've heard that this it's is mainly Dee Martini's fine. work. It's Louise. But anyway, um, so this actually goes through very specific conditions and how these can what are these conditions actually attached to? And there's just some really fascinating ones that I do find to hold true in a lot of the things that we do, or the, a lot of people that we see come through our practice. So one of the specific ones was lupus. And lupus had a lot to do with giving, but also it was um, better to die than to stand up for oneself. And I literally had a patient today that I just talked to with lupus, and she said, that she has never stood up for herself and her lupus onset was literally when her family just like ostracized her and she didn't stand up for herself and then her husband uh, she found out he was cheating and also had a child with another woman and she didn't divorce him and she just kind of just dealt with all of these scenarios and then started losing her hair and was diagnosed with discoid lupus. Do you want to explain what lupus is? Uh, lupus is a, an attack, an autoimmune attack on your connective tissue. It can manifest in many, many different ways. Uh, so this is definitely um, something really significant that, you know, it doesn't usually just happen overnight. It's usually brewing over time. But um, some like significant emotional trauma can really put it into motion. So even like headaches and migraines, this is um, resisting the flow of life. Um, so really just always resisting what's coming at you or thinking that you are a victim of your situation. Uh, knee pain, how many people have knee pain? Has a lot to do with being stubborn, um, having a big ego or pride, inability to bend. <laughs> are you laughing? I have knee pain right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I thought this was interesting, even just as a female, how many women complain of like having fat in their like hip and thigh area. And, um, I was getting a kick out of this for my personal self was lumps of stubborn fat, um, or, uh, lumps of stubborn fat from your, uh, having resentment towards your parents. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, uh, this is fantastic. So there are a lot of different correlations here um, when it really comes to these specific emotional things. So again, this is not everyone, but what you need to understand about this is if you're the person who's been trying to heal your psoriasis or trying to heal your lupus or trying to get rid of your knee pain and nothing is working, conventional, functional, holistic whatever there might be this other layer that is completely being overlooked or missed and it's usually not just you know black and white one thing it's usually you resolve this emotional piece and then you can actually do the physical work that your body needs in order to heal you know that's a big thing is like we always look at the body as just a single system mm -hmm. you know, all you have is emotional crap or all like it's all yeah. physical or maybe it's just you know it's like you have an infection in this tissue, but it's really, it's like, it's all about layers. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all like an onion. So it's like, first you might have to focus on emotional um, imbalances, but then after that, it's like, there may be an infection. And then after yeah. that, it's like, now we can actually work on rewiring the nervous system so the body and the brain are connected again. Well, I think it's all about timing. Is that, that's what a lot of people don't understand is they might say, I've already tried that and it didn't work, but it might not be the right timing because there might have been more of a foundational problem. So there are some people that we do this type of work with um, from an emotional perspective and we do it right away because that's their foundational problem. And there's some people that they have to 
foundationally, get more things balanced, deal with their gut issues or whatever the case may be before their their body and brain is, is even ready to work on that, that other emotional layer. So I think that one of the most significant things that um, we have learned uh, over time is that there is a such thing as a disassociation. There are definitely people that have been through really, really traumatic things in their life that they have disassociated from. So they actually don't consciously remember a specific event or a specific trauma. And um, with this, we have actually different ways that we test this in our practice to see if there is an emotional component, you know, when did it, um, what did, when did it happen and what is that emotion that they're holding on to? So this is something that's really significant for those people that just feel so mentally unwell or unstable, but they're, they're not really able to pinpoint when, why, or how. So, um, so there is a such thing as a disassociation. This is very, very common with um, physical and sexual abuse as well. But one thing too is, uh, we'll get weird on you now, is uh, something called transgenerational trauma. And I, wanna, I want people to understand this because some of you may have had this experience as a child or you may have a child or have a niece or a nephew that's dealing with it. So when you have kids, that you're like, why does my two-year-old have anxiety? Or why would my five-year-old be depressed? Or why is my kid worrying about things that they should know nothing about? And you see these really odd dynamics and these odd behaviors. Sometimes the, the different things that this kid is holding or experiencing is not theirs. It was either the fact that Mom could have been super anxious while they were in the womb or mom could have had a car accident that created a PTSD type of reaction or there has been a lineage of of anxiety in the family or a lineage of addiction in the family. Um, things like that. And I'm not saying that this is genetic. I'm saying that these are different behavioral traits that could have started generations back. There could have been a specific type of trauma that was never resolved that then imprinted in the genome and kept getting passed down generation to generation. So when you have these kids that are exhibiting these really odd behaviors, this is not always just like, oh, that's, you know, my kid's being weird, or maybe they watch something on TV. Sometimes it's more of a, a pattern that's happening generation after generation. You, you want to go somewhere with it? I can't. <laughs> So a lot of times what I see with trans transgenerational trauma, uh, science is, uh, well, let me take a step back. So there's epigenetics. Epigenetics is that transgeneration aspect of our genes. Um, the cool thing that science has actually proved now, I think it's up to seven generations. I know that I've read uh, that science has proved that literally five lineages, at least five uh, generations, that trauma can be passed down throughout our genes. Um, I think it's up to seven, but I haven't read that personally, so I'm not going to say it. Um, but the the cool thing is, is, like, you look at the body and it's not just physical. So I always uh, explain, really, nobody, for the most part, understands meridians. It's really just um, the energetic side, the energy side of our nervous system. So we have our nervous system of these highways that transmits literally information all throughout the body. On the energetic side of the body, we have meridians, which are do the exact same thing as our nervous system. It's just in an energetic aspect that runs mainly through our fascia. And by the way, when people are like meridians, what does that even mean? That's the foundation of acupuncture. So if you've had acupuncture and you've seen improvement with it, that's because you've had some type of stressors on your meridians. And when they put those needles into the meridian, it helps to clear that out. So, um, so that's definitely something that you can understand because I feel like a lot of people know acupuncture. They know that it helps people, but they actually don't know what it, what it's doing and how it's working. And the cool thing is that there is a science that actually proves, uh, meridian points as well as the whole meridians. So it's like every single meridian point actually has a higher electrical gradient. So if you actually go to and like take a, a meridian point and measure the electrical output, it's going to be higher. Uh, at that meridian point than compared to the skin around. And that just shows that there's these um, electrical impulses, mm -hmm. uh, information that's really tra 
traveling through. But after that side point, uh, there's epigenetics, which is the actual physical uh, translation of that trauma being passed down. And what happens is it creates a mutation in the actual gene, and that mutation will either cause the gene to turn off or turn on its expression. So on the energetic side of that, instead of having epigenetics, uh, what we have is called a miasm. So miasm is like in the energetic meridian world, uh, it is the exact same thing, um, but for the most part, it's actually in, uh, not to get too weird on you guys, uh, but in the magnetic field. So anything that has an electrical, uh, like electromagnetic, uh, has electrical, but it also has a magnetic. And that magnetic aspect is like you can look at your body and most people talk about auras. Um, auras sound voodoo, but the cool thing is that auras are real. It's just our magnetic field. Um, we just don't talk about it in the science point of view. We talk about it usually in the energetic uh, point of view, but your aura is really just your magnetic field that comes off of your electrical activity, hence for the most part, our nervous system. So really our miasms are our energetic field, our magnetic field containing the same thing as your epigenetics, but just in the energetic uh, transformation of energy. Well, I think too, it's like a lot of people when it comes to this whole energetic component and like, you know, like, I don't even know what that means. And is that even real? But I think one of the things that we can all relate to is that when you meet someone, you're either like, I love this person or like, I'm good. Don't ever want to hang out with them again. And all that is, is really just a transfer of energy. And you're kind of like picking up on their vibes is what we call it. But really you're just picking up on their energy and you've already made an executive decision if you like them or not. So this type of transfer is happening all the time and a lot of people are feeling it. Some people are more sensitive than others, but it's like the same thing. Like you go into a hospital and you're like, oh, I don't like, I don't like hospitals. Like it's just a bad, bad vibe in here, bad feeling in here. And it's like, you're just picking up on the energetic things around you. So all of us are, are experiences, experiencing this to some capacity. We just don't really know what it is. So I think that one of the big things is that um, people know that they get triggered. They just don't know why and what it actually is. So there's kind of two aspects that we're going to talk about in these next two slides is number one is your judgments and your triggers come from your values. And I'll tell my story because I think that, you know, some people will relate to that and I'm not having Nick expand upon it. But this is like such a silly story, but I feel like a lot of people can relate to it in some capacity. But I remember for me, before knowing like what my values were or anything, I would go out, you know, to dinner with friends and I would have my group of friends that we would all go out together, and, you know, enjoy, you know, going out. It was like one of our favorite things to do was spending quality time and eating good food. And we would have, you know, some friends that would come along and they would like nickel and dime the bill and it would always just like kill the vibe. And we're just like, oh, like, why do they have to do that? It's so annoying when they have to do that. And it's so interesting because when I came to really understanding my values, I understood that one of my highest values was quality time and relationships. So in my mind, I could not put a price on going out with the people that I cared about and spending time with them. So like, I didn't care what the bill cost because that wasn't my highest value. My highest value was the time that I was able to spend with the people that I care about. So what I didn't realize at that time is I'm placing a judgment on these people that are, you know, maybe nickel and diving the bill, but really at the end of the day, their values were completely different. They valued probably how much savings was in their bank account. And they valued that maybe because they wanted to have a savings account to put their kid through college one day. I don't really know, but I'm sitting here placing a judgment on someone who values something completely different. And in that moment of realizing this, it was just so freeing of knowing that so many other things that I get annoyed about or a trigger to me really have to do with me pushing my values onto others. And this was something that once I was able to realize that I was able to really step into situations differently and also feel not feel triggered and also feel less judgmental and let go of judgments, even that people were potentially 
pushing on to me because I knew at that point they were just operating out of their own value system. Everyone is always operating out of their value system. And when your in-laws are telling you how you should raise your kid or how you should like clean your house, they're doing it because that's their value system and that's what, what they know best. So it's just like, okay, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And just knowing that that's okay that you're not maybe in alignment with those values. So I'll let Nick talk more about that. No, I was like, I mean, hundred percent, you nailed it. It's like really, uh, anytime we become triggered, it's because we're trying to control a situation and we always want to control, um, our belief system and our belief system really is our values. Our values create what we believe to be true to us. It's going to serve us the most. Uh, so when that's getting challenged, of course, um, we're going to create a trigger and try to control the situation because we don't want what's most important to us, our values, um, to really be challenged. Uh, and in doing so, I always, and I might be jumping forward, let me know if I am. Uh, <laughs> but with relationships, we, we only have three options. Um, we have a win-win, a win-lose, and a lose-lose. Uh, so with that, the understanding that there's always an exchange um, with everything that we come in contact to, uh, and it needs to be a fair exchange. So it's like when a win-win comes down, uh, first you have to figure out what's most important to you, your values, so that you can actually serve those. Um, but then in relationships, whether it's a relationship at home, a relationship with your kids, a relationship at work, it has to be that win-win. Uh, so you have to figure out what's most important to that other person so that their values can be just and equally as served as your values so that both parties are having a fair exchange. When a lot of times, though, what happens, especially in the States, it's a it's at least a win-lose or a lose-lose. Mm -hmm. So the win-lose is, well, you should really be acting in accordance to my value system because that's what I want to happen. And I know better than you because I'm really smart. Um, that's really understanding that you don't love the other person. You expect them to act and see within your value system. Uh, and really what it's the famous saying though of uh, if you just do it this way yeah. everything will be better if you just pick up the kids on time or just keep the house clean then everything will be better and that's really one of our very close friends um, that run relationship development they call that demand relationship mm -hmm. and we just have kind of a different name for it is it's really just you're you're projecting your values onto someone else and not really understanding that both sets of values in a relationship are actually serving two different purposes. You know, how many people get divorced because the woman maybe decided to stay at home and take care of the kids and her highest value is, is making sure the kids are in a good school, they're playing sports, they're learning an instrument and like, you know, the big focus is that and making sure obviously the house is well kept. And then there's men that are like out and their, their primary value is to make money. And they're unhappy with each other because they're just like, you need to spend more time with the kids and, oh, maybe you should go get a job. And, and there's this dynamic when really at the end of the day, if they were to see more clearly or be probed with better questions, they would understand that they can't really function independently. You need the money to make sure that, you know, the kids are going into the schools that you want. They're getting their school clothes. They're able to, you know, get the, the music lessons and all of that. And then also the male is, you know, being able to come home to a comfortable house where, you know, he feels cared for. So it's been so interesting seeing you as well as even Demartini take people through these, these uh, the Demartini method and asking better questions and being able to just bring into their perception that they are in perfect balance, but they're just projecting their values on each other and with blinders on. Oh, hundred percent. And it's like a lot of times, you know, it's like first you got to have information to build to make a decision on that. And one of the things, especially in marriages is all we start at the foundation, the actual day we got married. Uh, so when you say your vows at the end, it's like, you know, for better or worse and sickness and health for richer or poor, all these things we're not really conscious of, but it's saying that you love equally both sides and both potentials of the person. Yeah. And it's just like, when you look at it, it's just brilliantly beautiful. Yeah. Nick's always going to get emotional. <laughs>
Um, talking about feelings here, jeez. One thing I, I think is really interesting too is that when uh, being from New Jersey and living in the tri-state area between New York, Philadelphia, Jersey, there is a lot of strong-willed and strong-minded people. And I cannot tell you how many times I hear, yeah, I'm stressed. Everybody's stressed. I can handle it though. I can handle stress. I'm really strong, you know, like I, I know how to deal with it and, you know, like stress, whatever, I can handle it. And it's very interesting because I then explained to them that just because you can handle stress doesn't mean that your body has evolved past those stress responses. So when you're stressed and maybe it's because you got into an argument with your spouse or maybe you got a, a nasty email from your boss, your body immediately starts to pump out stress hormones as if you were in the woods about a fight, about to fight a tiger or run. So despite you being able to handle stress, that does not mean your body is not having a physiological response. So living in a state of stress or just dealing with stress and not necessarily changing your situation, that is not necessarily something that you're handling because physiologically your body is going to be stressed, but then it's going to get into a state of crisis. And that state of crisis is when you're so fatigued that you can't get out of bed anymore or you're not sleeping anymore and you're completely burnt out and can't think straight. Well, and the common aspect of it is um, it's like when I'm doing an integrative practice, it's uh, very cool to see because it's like the longer we handle it, the more stress onto our adrenals, which produces cortisol uh, for us to be able to handle it. Then cortisol goes back to the brain and it affects your pituitary gland, which also affects your thyroid as well as your reproductive yeah. organs. So a lot of times you'll see people with hormone issues. Uh, that's them, the hormones being off, and now they're trying to go and chase their hormone imbalances. That's yeah. really just been coming back to them handling their stress, which has caused their adrenal um, burnout. Yeah, so that's the fascinating thing is like we work with hormones all the time, but very rarely are we helping someone's hormones through um, using different, you know, supplementation, nutraceuticals, bioidenticals to manipulate their hormones. Once we fix the foundation of dealing with the stress or, or dealing with liver issues or dealing with inflammatory issues or dealing with neurological issues, once you balance that out, almost everyone's hormones auto correct. So if you've been on this journey of like, fix my hormones, fix my hormones, and it's not necessarily improving, then it definitely can be a lot more deeper rooted. And I'm not going to say that every time it's emotional, but it could easily be some type of overproduction of stress hormones, like Nick said, or it could be even a toxicity issue. So don't chase hormones because very common, there is more of a foundational problem. So I know that we've already talked about the judgment aspect, but again, is the judgments are very dictated by what your values are. And once you realize that and you just, when you get triggered by that person and you go, oh, all right, they're pushing their values onto me, that's okay, I get it. And you're able to really feel free of that. It's just such an interesting way that you show up in the world. By the way, Instagrammers, this is going to cut us off in a minute and a half. So if you do want the full webinar, you're going to have to shoot us your email through a direct message. So I know the biggest thing, too, is that people are probably like, can you even do testing for these types of things? And obviously, it's about asking better questions is number one when it comes to really digging into our, you know, is the... Uh, are there issues from an emotional perspective that are causing you to not be well or are causing you to have an obstacle with getting well? And with our practice, we actually have a couple of different ways of analyzing this. So number one, this is super blurry, but um, we have actually a technology called the BioScan. The BioScan has the ability to actually evaluate different types of emotional things that you are holding in your subconscious. Um, it also has the ability to help to neutralize some of these things. But in addition, we, mind, we mainly use this when we hit a roadblock with certain patients that are just like, I don't know what I'm holding on to. I know I'm stressed and I know I feel like crap, but I just don't know because I've been through so many things in my life 
or whatever the case may be. So we use this as a tool. We don't use it necessarily as a diagnostic. It just gives us more information that we might not be able to gather through conversation. But from there, we're really able to also leverage what we call the Demartini method, which we're gonna talk more about. So I know that a lot of times therapy is really the first thing that's presented to us. And for those of you that have been with us the entire time, I said very early on is that I think therapy has its time and place, but we opted to try to learn a different modality outside of just conventional therapy. And we did that primarily because of our background in neurology. And we wanted to find a different way to help people really collapse these judgments and perceptions and resolve um, their perceptions around these, these different, you know, situations, traumas, whatever you want to call it. And we wanted to do it in a way that we weren't having to have them tell their story over and over again, because that story creates a lot of really strong neurological pathways. And once you have these strong pathways, it makes it harder and harder to actually work through and and resolve the the judgment, the emotion, the resentment, you know, wh whatever the case may be. So the method is really a beautiful thing because of it using the foundation of physics, number one, and it also taking into consideration what are your actual values. And I'll let Nick just kind of talk about a little bit more about the method and, and how it is using physics uh, in a really strategic way to help to balance things out in, in the mind as well as the body. Yeah, so I mean, we talked a little bit about it and, you know, the myth that therapy is the only option and it would be a myth thinking that the Demartini method is the only option as well. Mm -hmm. It's like I've learned well over a dozen different uh, methods, systems, techniques to help the, the body, the system, the mind uh, deal with emotional triggers and stresses. And some of, other, some of them are amazing, um, but they're short lived uh, because you can remove the stress, but unless you actually change the program, as soon as that stress has come back into the system, it's like, well, we got to deal with it again because our program is going to react the exact same way because we've never changed it. And that's one of my favorite things about the Demartini method is that it's sustainable. I mean, we go through literally it feels like every week now we have to update our cell phone because there's a better program for it to work off of, but our mind, we haven't updated it maybe ever. Uh, so it really, like when you look at our brain being able to increase the quality, uh, to increase the quality of your life, we have to update the programs that we're utilizing for ourselves. And for me, that's where the Demartini method comes in because not only uh, is it helping you not to pretty much increase that neuroplasticity that Nicole was talking about, that the story of going over and over and over, it's like riding a bike, you know, eventually you can ride a bike with no hands and I always joke about now kids are riding a bike texting, uh, which is just crazy. <laughs> so it's just the same thing. It's like eventually you don't even have to think and your nervous system is running the story that's really just creating havoc and chaos uh, within your body. And whether that ends up in the liver or whether that ends up in the stress and over time that compounded stress is going to create symptoms and pain. So really when looking at the Demartini method, uh, it starts, it starts uh, with really figuring out who you are, what's most important to you. Uh, and that's known as your top three values. Um, you can, uh, one of the, like, if you're listening to this right now, definitely afterwards, go over to his website and do the values determination method. Uh, it's amazing. So after you figure out really what's most important to you, uh, then we go through and we really figure out what's most imbalanced in your life, what's actually controlling you and you don't have any control over. Uh, so it's either, you know, on that positive or on that negative side, it could be something that you are, have a fantasy about, or it could be something that you really resent or despise. Uh, so it's really getting crystal clear on what that is, if it's an action, if it's an inaction or a trait, because uh, you can only change one thing in your life and that's facts. Uh, you can't change the story, which, Unfortunately, so many therapists are working with a story and the story wasn't even real. Uh, so you're just wasting a lot of time and money when that's what you're focusing on. 
When well, it's not to be insensitive that the story is not real, but it's just very often, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that you only see one side because of the animalistic nature. So you're only seeing either the drawbacks or the positives or vice versa. So when we only see the one side, that's when we have this story or we have this imbalance. Yeah, and I mean, initially we created a story to help protect us, um, but eventually that story, what was once a service, ends up becoming a disservice. Uh, so it's really going through and having that uh, quality awareness to be able to bring the, and working on the actual facts, uh, back into where what you once resented, you actually end up being grateful for because you see all the benefits that actually came out of it that you weren't aware of the first time. Uh, so it's really crazy and it doesn't matter if, you know, it was something crazy traumatic or just a small judgment. Once we can bring that into balance and see that there's an equal amount of drawbacks as well as benefits, then we actually have a choice to be able to use it to serve us instead of us being or it being the program and running us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, the method is just amazing. We're going to talk a little bit more about how we structure it, too. But I think that, you know, this webinar, um, I see a lot of the comments that came through here as well as on Instagram. And it's just like, you know, people are like, holy crap, I didn't know that. And that's really the beauty of why we do this is because you don't know what you don't know. And you could be easily suffering with some type of chronic illness, autoimmune condition, gut issue, and n nobody is necessarily asking you better questions about, you know, did this start when you had a time of stress? Did this start after your loved one passed? Did this start after you got a divorce? And to start after you got a concussion. Yeah. So it's really just so significant because when you ask better questions and you dig deeper, then you really start to piece the puzzle together and you actually can help people on a deeper level because you're figuring out what is the root, what is the foundation. And I think that a lot of times, especially even when it comes to mental health, we're just blaming this on bad luck and bad genes. And I'm not saying that's your fault. It's just what we've been programmed to think, you know, oh, depression runs in my family. Oh, anxiety runs in my family. And we're just thinking that we're doomed and we're just like, we don't feel like we can be in the driver's seat. We don't even know what's out there that can help us. And we do these webinars so that people can see you know, another side and really be able to understand, you know, what are some of these therapies that can help to really uncover the root, but give you strategies that are going to create sustainability. I think that that's the biggest thing is that we opted to use this method because it's creating a sustainable change. It's not like you come in and you do the method with Nick and you're like, I feel good right now, but then I'm going to leave and I'm going to feel like crap again once I go back into real life. You walk away with a completely different perception and just feeling so much more balanced and grounded in your life. So again, it's like things don't manifest like the textbook. So just because you have lupus doesn't mean you have lupus and you're doomed and there's nothing you can do about it and medication is the only route. Maybe this, you know, roots back to really um, some negative thoughts and judgments you have on yourself. And maybe that specific condition was triggered by some type of emotional event, if it was a loss or if it was, you know, something else. So we really need to understand that we are an integration of systems and we have so much potential for the things that really cause us to be symptomatic or cause us to have a specific diagnosis as well. And if you can't tell already that uh, we have really taken the old model and evolved it into the new model, um, you know, we started our practice with really focusing on, you know, diet and supplements and doing better testing, blood work, heavy metal testing. And for every void that we hit, we kept growing, evolving and changing our approach. And really for Nick, he has pioneered and learning so many different techniques and modalities to help people deal with stress and deal with emotional adversities. And, you know, he definitely still does a blend of things, but the Demartini has really been, I think, one of the primary therapies that we've created or we've seen the most sustainable, positive changes. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Yeah. I was saying to a, a person today that we're, we're very, very content with our systems in place, but we're never satisfied. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for better ways to be able to put it, all the pieces of the puzzle together to be able to not only help ourselves, but also to help other people to just get better, quicker, and be more sustainable. Of course. And I know that overall, you know, people always, when they watch the webinars, they're really curious how it all works. And, you know, for what Dr. Nick does, so the he does a pre-method, a pre-Demartini method, which we'll talk about in the next minute or so. He also does the Demartini method, which is actually done over the course of a few hours. So this is not something that you're necessarily coming and doing, you know, an hour here, an hour there, and it's like, you know, going on for months upon years. The method is done over the course of a few hours. Some people choose to do a couple of sessions because they have so many things that they want to work through. But after that, he does another session, which he calls the posty martini. I call it the implementation method because I think that, you know, the really fascinating thing about it is that when people have this new shift in their mindset and they don't feel like a victim anymore or they're not, they're letting go of the rage and the anger, they end up showing up differently in their lives. And specifically, we had one patient who she completely transformed the way that she felt about herself and also she really let go of feeling like a victim from a specific scenario she had in her life and when she went back to her community her friends and her family she realized that a lot of the community that she built over the past few years were in a very similar mindset and, and they saw her for being a victim yeah, and they were almost retaliating against her of like, who do you think you are? You know, how dare you even think that, you know, you're not going to be a victim anymore. Like, you're so unrealistic. You know, life is hard and this is going to happen to you again. And she came back to Nick being like, oh, my gosh, you didn't prepare me for, you know, what was going to going to happen. And so he started doing this this post um, session so that he can help you to really be able to know how to step into your life, your environment, and how to also potentially deal with difficult uh, conversations that you might have with your your loved ones, family, and friends. So, um, so we really, the method is amazing, and we've really been strategic on how to lay it out, but because of the amount of time that we give and the amount of time that it takes is that this is not always falling necessarily in that insurance realm. Um, we definitely give you all the appropriate paperwork for people to get potential reimbursement, but I think at the end of the day, we choose in our practice to serve people and not serve insurance providers mm -hmm. because they dictate what they think is best for you and they don't even know you. Uh, they literally say that doctors aren't allowed to spend more than 15 minutes with a patient, otherwise there's zero reimbursement. So our system is so unbelievably broken and we really have opted to do what is best for the patient, which has required us to be out of network with these companies. Because if we just stayed in network like everyone else, then we would never be able to see our patients' lives completely transformed. And that's really what we're here to do, is to create those types of breakthrough experiences. And I think we also forget that healthcare is supposed to be about answers and solutions. And, you know, we've settled for, oh, your blood work looks good. We don't really know what's wrong with you. Or your only option is this medication. Because I still can't get over how many gastroenterologists say that diet has nothing to do with your, like, irritable bowel. I just feel like that's not even common sense. But anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Trigger. <laughs> So like I said earlier, for those of you that are just hopping on now is that, you know, we do really leverage some of our testing when it comes to people that feel really stuck and they feel like, I have anger, I have fear, I have abandonment, I have shame, I have all of these things, and I don't know which is my primary, and I don't know which is affecting me the most. We will definitely leverage some of our testing to help us get clarity. And, you know, with that being said, is then, then we are able to get more direction on how to use the method most efficiently. And first and foremost, Nick is helping you determine what your values are. And I know you have some like interesting feedback from, you know, patients when they've done their values and they're just like, how is this the first time somebody's talking about this with me? Oh, it's 
literally every time, you know, it's like we even did a staff retreat and like we go over with all of our employees to figure out what's most important. Cause I would say like this should be taught literally in every single elementary school mm -hmm. in every single school. Um, because when teachers can go around and connect with the students to be able to figure out and like actually teach to what's most important to a kid, then they're actually going to learn and listen because it's going to serve them. It's like, we don't care about anything for the most part, just being selfish, uh, that doesn't value us. So when you can actually speak to someone that's going to what is most important in their life, then it's just, it's all the ears and there's, there's really no, um, roadblocks and barriers towards learning. So it's like, we've never been taught to actually take the time to figure out what's most important in my life. And also understand that what's most important in my life now may change next month, may change next week. Um, so it's like anytime there's major events that happen in our life, uh, things can actually, your what's most important to you will change. So it's like a couple months ago, I started getting some negative feedbacks, uh, quote unquote, some pain from the quality of my questions. And I quickly realized that after a couple of days, I was like, I think something changed. So I went back and jumped in the sauna, you know, took 45 minutes, went down and noticed that two of my values had slightly shifted. So I changed and I shifted the quality of my questions to what my new values were instead of my old values, because my old values were serving not me anymore. They were serving my old values. And in doing so, I was getting results that weren't serving me. So after actually changing the questions to serve my new values, the, the feedback mechanism changed and I wasn't getting the pain response. I was getting things that were actually serving me. So first and foremost, it's like we have to know what's most important to us. And then from there, we also figure out like what I was talking about, what's most polarized and is in controlling us instead of us being able to use it to serve ourselves. And then that takes us into the actual Demartini method, um, depending on, and we kind of figure out how much time roughly it's going to take. Um, but you really want to pretty much collapse, bring back to neutral, whatever we're resenting in that, in that set amount of time period. So whether that's dealing with uh, the loss and grief or another aspect of self judgment or something that we've actually judged uh, happening to us from someone else, uh, we're, we really want to set enough time that we can actually bring that whole um, judgment into balance during that uh, that time period. And then, like you said, uh, after that, we're not the same person. So <laughs> we need the implementation, what I call the post Demartini, um, to really make sure that going on with life, uh, that we know how to pretty much show up yeah. and be our new self. Well, I think it's really funny because one of the stories that Martini told when we were at one of his conferences is how when you understand your values and you understand your spouse's values, like you can, you can almost leverage it. And he was, you know, it was a funny story, but it, it was, it was a win-win, let's put it that way. So there was a husband that really wanted to go to a, uh, like a golfing tournament but he knew that his wife was going to give pushback because, you know, she wanted him to like spend time with the kids and everything else. So one of her biggest values was actually um, making sure the house was beautiful and also making sure she looked very nice. So she really loved clothes and shoes. So he pretty much Just leveraged. Doesn't sound familiar it doesn't at all. sound familiar. <laughs> so he pretty much leveraged and said, so I would love for you to come with me. Um, the, the tournament is actually in this town and we're going to be passing right by this amazing linen store for those new sheets that you've been wanting. And then while I'm golfing, there's actually a beautiful mall right around the corner. And she was like, okay, let's go. So it's just like very funny because it was a win-win for both of them, but he was able to leverage knowing her values in order to, you know, kind of get what he wanted essentially. But she was just not thinking about it that way because they were both going to have, you know, benefits from understanding each other's values. So, uh, so I thought that was really cool. Um, but also too, when it comes to our Demartini method, um, this is something that you can actually do as part of our integrative programs, or it's something that you can actually just do um, coming into our practice. So if you do want more information about this, you can definitely hop on a strategy call with one of our team members 
actually, I'm going to put this here because I always forget to do this. But um, if you guys actually use this link to hop on a strategy call and then you eventually book your Martini method, um, you actually will get $200 off using this link specifically. So definitely use it. It's only going to be available for the next 72 hours. If you are long distance, just know that you can actually do any of our testing from a distance, but you can also do uh, the Martini method from a distance. You guys would do it on Zoom conference. So we've actually had quite a few um, people from all different parts of the country uh, do those sessions with Nick. And, I'm still uh, wanting to go out of the country. The farthest is California, but uh, I haven't gotten out of the country yet. <laughs> so if you're listening to this out of the country, please. <laughs> so I don't see that there's any questions, but um, Michelle, if you are still here, I hope uh, you really enjoyed this. And uh, if you do want to listen to our last module that was just provided last um, last week was actually all about concussions and it is something that we work with and we we help a lot of people that have suffered with concussions because it is something that you know unfortunately not a lot of people are getting um, you know tended to properly but I really hope you guys enjoyed this uh, we really really love doing it and I'm really just excited about Nick being able to be part of this and showcasing some of these you know his zone of genius and some of the amazing things that he does for our patients here at IWG so um, so I really hope that you can take some time to learn a little bit more about the method and potentially even experience it by um, coming uh, through our doors and working with him directly. All right, guys. So uh, if you want more information, check out our website, integrativewellnessgroup.com. And we were, will be doing another module uh, next week. And then we will be uh, kicking off some of our holidays uh, webinar series in December. And Nick's going to be talking about how to deal with your family <laughs> <laughs> during the holidays and how to handle your triggers. So, um, so we will see you next week. And we hope you enjoyed.